Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Louise Mirror, President and CEO of the New York Historical Society. Tonight's program is a special presentation featuring a talk on the winning book of the 2020 Gilder Lerman Prize for Military History at the New York Historical Society. We're thrilled to be partnering with the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History on this prize. It's thanks to the leadership of Lewis E. Lerman and the late Richard Gilder that we have joined together for the presentation of this award. I'd like to thank our incredible New York Historical Trustees who are joining us this evening, as well as all of our Chairman's Council members. Tonight's program will last an hour, including 15 minutes for questions and answers. Your questions can be submitted via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. In the interest of simplicity, we've disabled the chat function tonight, so please do remember to use the Q&A. Our speakers will get to as many questions as time allows. I'd now like to welcome Dr. James Basker, a treasured member of the New York Historical Society's Board of Trustees and president of the Gilder Lerman Institute, as well as tremendous personal friend. Dr. Basker will introduce the prize and this year's winner. Once again, thank you and good evening. Thank you, Louise, and thank you to Alex Kissel and Dale Gregory and all the team at the New York Historical Society who have come together to make this program possible tonight and bring us together across distances. I know some of uh, the people in the program this evening are in the Caribbean, others in Louisiana, I'm in New York, um, and we're all together on Zoom. As Louise said, I'm Jim Basker and I'm president of the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. And we are delighted to co-sponsor this award, the Military History Book Prize for the best book in English on military history of any period from the ancient past to the modern world. As many in the audience know, the Gilder Lehrman Institute sponsors three other book prizes, the Lincoln Prize in partnership with Gettysburg College, the Frederick Douglass Prize with uh, the Gilder Lehrman Center at Yale University, and the George Washington Book Prize in partnership with George Washington's Mount Vernon and George Washington College. With all of these book prizes, we seek to honor great history writing and to bring that history to a wider audience beyond the academy, especially to teachers and students of the 30,000 affiliate schools in our network. We believe that in these schools, we're reaching something approaching 8 million students. History was never more important than today, but the subject is not doing well. The latest NEP tests show that only 15% of eighth graders in the United States are proficient in history. Uh, it's a terrible problem, a problem of uh, historical illiteracy on a national scale. If any of you would like to join the, in the fight against historical illiter illiteracy, please write to me at the Institute and we will welcome your support in any role. But tonight, my job is to introduce the program. And first, some thanks. Uh, thanks go, as you've heard, to Lewis Lehrman, whose idea it was to create this prize and whose generous support makes it possible. Lou is, of course, the co-founder with the late Richard Gilder of the Gilder Lehrman Institute. And it was Lou who, with Dick Gilder, built the Gilder Lehrman Collection, now of 80,000 rare American historical manuscripts, which are on deposit at the New York Historical Society. And it is Lou who today, as chair of our board, continues to guide the Institute in its mission and programs, along with 34 other trustees. So enormous thanks are due to Lou. Thanks are also due to the jury who worked so hard to review and evaluate the dozens of books that were nominated for this prize. And I'd like to mention each of them by name uh, rapidly. First, Flora Fraser, a British biographer and historian, chair of the Elizabeth Longford Prize for Historical Biography, author of many biographies of 18th century figures, including most recently, The Washingtons. Next, Alan Gelzo, an American historian, prize-winning writer, senior research scholar in the Council of the Humanities at Princeton University and director of the James Madison Program's initiative in politics and statesmanship. And his biography of Robert E. Lee has come out recently to considerable acclaim. 
Next, Ian Beckett, distinguished historian in Britain, chairman of the Council of the Army Records Society and professor of military history at the University of Kent. Next, Craig Simons, the distinguished visiting Ernest J. King professor of maritime history at the US Naval War College and himself a winner of the Lincoln Prize. And leading them all, the chair, the estimable chair of this jury, Andrew Roberts, author of many important history books, visiting professor at the War Studies Department of King's College London, and author uh, most recently, uh, just out, a biography of George III called Last King of America, which we are all dying to read, Andrew, as soon as we can get our hands on it. Um, I want to uh, move on from uh, thanking the jury to congratulate the finalists for this year's prize, and each of them uh, should be mentioned in turn. They were chosen from scores of nominated books, and each of these books is very distinguished in its own right. The five finalists include Richard B. Frank for Tower of Skulls, A History of the Asia Pacific War, July 1937 to 1942. Donald Johnson for Occupied America, British Military Rule and the Experience of Revolution. Martin Sherwin for Gambling with Armageddon, Nuclear Roulette from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Daniel Todman for Britain's War, A New World, 1942 to 1947 and Ian Toll for Twilight of the Gods, War in the Western Pacific, 1944 to 1945. Congratulations to all of these historians and I encourage everyone uh, hearing the program tonight to have a look out for those books and read them as well. But now to the program, which consists of the presentation of this year's $50,000 Military History Prize to Alexander Mika Baritze, for his colossal, The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History. Uh, I wanna congratulate Alexander for this book, which was a, a thrill to read. And I wanna turn you over now to Andrew Roberts, the chair of the jury, uh, who will make the presentation, tell you more about the winning book, and then lead what I think will be a very enjoyable conversation, um, followed, following which there'll be a, a question and answer period. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Jim, and thank you for those kind words. Uh, it's a, a shame really that I can't be there with you, um, Alexander, to hand over the check for $50,000. It's always the most <laughs> fun part, as you can imagine, <laughs> of, the, uh, of the evening. Um, but many congratulations on winning this, uh, this prize. It really is a, um, a true masterpiece. I know it's a true masterpiece because on the front cover there, you can see <laughs> me saying that it's a, a true masterpiece. Um, and uh, the uh, judges uh, all thought so too. So the first question I'd like to ask is um, that uh, there have been libraries, literally libraries uh, written about Napoleon. Uh, how have you managed to differentiate your book from the tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of books that have been written there. It's said that there's been a book written with Napoleon and the title um, Every Day Since His Death in 1821. <laughs> How on earth were you able to differentiate yours? Well, thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank uh, the, the members of the jury uh, uh, um, for, for um, selecting me. Uh, I was stunned uh, when, when I heard um, about the prize. I want to thank the fellow nominees, because when I saw who were in the uh, in the running, uh, I was flabbergasted. And of course, the um, Gilda Lerman Institute for, for this great honor. And I want to acknowledge uh, Professor uh, Donald D. Horvard, who is the main reason uh, of becoming a historian. He passed away uh, this past Sunday. Uh, he was a friend, uh, he was a mentor, a father figure, and a role model for me, and I want to dedicate this prize to him. Now, as for the question, <laughs> yes, um, I think more books have been written about Napoleon than um, anyone else. Historians certainly uh, been busy. Um, but if we look at the historiography of the subject, then what we'll see is that um, much of that body of work is, is limited in its focus to Europe, 
And within Europe, it is limited to Franco-English subject matter, the personalities, campaigns, politics. So I'm I um, by birth from Georgia, a small country in the Caucasus, uh, very proud of its history, uh, of, of, of its culture. Uh, when I came over to pursue my PhD, um, I always looked for the traces of my country, my history, and I couldn't find it, even though I knew that it was integral part to this Napoleonic War period in particular. And so what I wanted to do in this book is to broaden the perspective, to move away from Europe and offer a perspective that will be more international, more transnational, um, a perspective that will highlight the fact that uh, between 1792 and 1815, European affairs did not unfold in isolation from the rest of the world, that the impact, the, the tremors uh, that began in France in 1789 uh, reverberated all around the world. And I think um, the core message here um, is not, um, is rather than remaining on the periphery of the story, this is the core of its significance that Napoleonic Wars uh, was a, a, a conflict of world significance that uh, pushed many regions on new trajectories of history. And, uh, and you've subtitled the book, uh, A Global History. How on earth do you go about writing <laughs> a global history? Tell me how many languages you've got, how many, uh, I don't know, just, just <laughs> how do you start? Well, uh, um, you know, as many Europeans, um, I think, uh, uh, being able to speak in multiple languages comes uh, relatively easy. Um, at least um, when I came to the United States, uh, I already uh, had a mastery of, uh, of four languages uh, and, and uh, only added as, as I went along. And I think that um, globalization is, an emerge, is emerging as a major economic, cultural, and political force in, in the modern world. And it has uh, an increasing um, impact on how we as historians approach uh, um, the crafting of history. It certainly uh, fundamentally altered um, our ways of knowing. And I think it is no longer sufficient to study nations in isolation. Um, it's perfectly fine, but I, I think it, it uh, broadening the horizons offers uh, new and exciting possibilities. Um, it, it does require, as we see, it, 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 um, Re, you know, re-evaluation of, of individuals or nations' role and place in, in world history. Um, but this new pro approach, um, I think, underscores themes that long has been studied in our profession. This is stories of trade. This is stories of migration, slavery, and above all, what we now call the new imperial history, where I think my book falls. So my approach is that it is um, that it is far more interesting and nuanced to look at the global uh, at Napoleonic Wars from international, uh, a precise you know, a, pro a, a proper way will be to say transnational and comparative way, uh, and and place France not as uh, the aggressor nation um, that is oftentimes is, is, it is portrayed as, but to put it in the wider context of imperial uh, rivalries all across the world. Uh, it, it is a hard, uh, it's a hard approach uh, uh, requiring uh, languages, skills, but I think it's worthwhile. Well, and also the most extraordinary amount of research. I think one of the reasons that you won this prize was that the, um, well, I know one of the reasons you won this prize was that uh, I was chairing the judges, so I do know, uh, was the incredible amount of research that has uh, gone into it. Um, it's actually not as long a book as it looks. It's only 642 pages, but then there are another 300 pages of notes, bibliography, and index. Um, tell us about the research for this, uh, this project. Um, to, to, to write this book, um, I thought it was important um, to not just consult the uh, standard, what I would say, a standard historiography of, of in, in, in English and French, but rather to look at um, at, at issues from regional point of view, uh, which requires uh, to look at this uh, research of the, what has been written in, in uh, respective regions. So when we talk about, let's say, um, Russian, Ottoman, Persian, and French rivalry for the control of Caucasus, my home 
uh, country. Uh, I think it, it needs to be done in Russia. You know, you need to look at the uh, historiography of uh, Russian and Georgian and Armenian. Uh, not to mention Ottoman and 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 uh, Iranian, and the same applies to other parts of the world. So I try to uh, approach uh, Indian subject with the understanding of what uh, Indian his, you know, historiography has to say, and what are my fellow colleagues in Latin America are saying about the rising field of the right imperial studies in the Atlantic world, um, and and it does uh, re require uh, a lot of patience, and uh, uh, but but it worked work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it also takes you to, you know, China and Iran and, uh, and um, North Africa, of course. And so uh, that's the, uh, Andrew, that's the only question. part where my wife was not complaining about book writing. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've no I noticed that when I was writing about Napoleon, it's anywhere that it was sunny, she was quite prepared to go to, but for some reason, she didn't want to go to Malayaro Slavic. <laughs> Um, look, um, what about, tell me about the, the region that you think, um, two questions really. One, the region that you were surprised by uh, having been deeply affected by the Napoleonic Wars, and also the region that you think that was most affected beyond Europe by the Napoleonic Wars. Thank you. Um, I think the surprising part, usually when we, when we talk about Napoleonic Wars, the historiography is so Eurocentric that we don't realize the, the far-reaching effects of it. So in places like Japan, where we have a British attack on Nagasaki in 1808, or the two attempted... Yeah, sorry, Walter, remind me what the British were doing, the Royal Navy was doing. Was it, uh, was it Pellew who attacked Nagasaki in 1808? That's right. What, what, why? What was all that about? Um, and, and that's one of the themes, I think, of the book, and that is the, uh, alongside imperial rivalries, you have the economic competition, right? And of course, the Dutch had a longstanding presence in, in Japan and had uh, commercial uh, concessions that uh, certainly the British East India Company especially was interested in, in acquiring. Uh, um, and, and, and that includes not just Japan, but in places more of like modern day Indonesia, where the Dutch had colony. Uh, and I think the two attempts to open up China, so to speak, by the British again, one in 1801 uh, and then a much larger one in 1808, uh, I think uh, oftentimes lost in the largest narrative. Uh, I think in terms of the impact um, in, in the book, in, 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 in conversations, I think I always emphasize that as, as impactful as Napoleonic War was in Europe, uh, um, to me, the biggest impact is in the Western Hemisphere. It is in places like United States, where here I am speaking from Louisiana, which is part of the United States. Louisiana Purchase is part of Napoleonic narrative or narrative of this conflict. And of course, the, the, um, the, uh, the decline and, and in fact the collapse of the Spanish empire and the creation of the new reality in the Western hemisphere is all caused and contributed and driven by the Napoleonic realities. Yes, I, I see you've got a picture of, um, or at least a cartoon of King George III behind you there, slaying the dragon of uh, Napoleon <laughs> and protecting uh, <laughs> Britannia. Um, and uh, it was, um, it obviously did give Britain um, in the Treaty of Vienna some important nodal points around the world, like, uh, like Ceylon, modern day Sri Lanka and Cape Town and so on. So how important were, were the Napoleonic Wars for for essentially um, setting the scene for the rest of the 19th century? I think they are, um, uh, to me, um, they are part of that great divergence that has been uh, you know, discussed over, over the past two, two decades in, in the wake of that famous publication. That is a moment when uh, Europe is emerging, not just as, as one of the peripheral regions, but as a region that has uh, amassed economic, political, military, administrative advantages that allows it in, in, uh, over the subsequent century to dominate uh, on a global scale. Uh, and, and that, I think the, the foundation for it in many respects is set in the Napoleonic um, era, especially because of the British triumph um, in, this, in this war. And uh, um, one of the points that I make in the book is that uh, by 1811, Britain had effectively won the global war. So Napoleon, uh, in hindsight, of course, we now realize that by Napoleon at the time, I think could only hope to win a regional war for European dominance, but the war for the seas, for the globe, 
the, the world war uh, is already thrown in the, uh, in, the, in the British side. If we could go back uh, a decade or so, um, the Peace of Amiens is a very important moment, isn't it? Where for about 15 months or, or so, Britain and Napoleon make peace and, uh, and then it breaks down. Um, and what you point out in this book very effectively, I think, is that Napoleon didn't want it to break down. And it's not to say that he didn't do things that um, helped lead to the breakdown of it, but um, uh, essentially, as certainly as far as the letter of the peace was concerned, it was the British who broke it. Tell us a bit about uh, Amiens. Um, I think, uh, broadly looking on, at this period, uh, the collapse of the Treaty of Amiens, to me, is one of the crucial uh, points in, in not just the saga of, of Napoleonic Wars, but in fact, in, in, in modern history in that sense, because it is the collapse of this treaty that unleashes the 12 years of, of uh, destructive wars, misery, and, and it will shape the destinies of Europe um, to a far greater degree than, the, you know, than would have been possible. Uh, so the question of responsibility, I think, has been the subject of, of long debates and discussions, and usually it is blamed on France and on Napoleon uh, uh, personally, and I think quite a few historians uh, believe that it was part of his that megalomania and, and imperial lust. I, 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 I'm, I, to me, I think the, the answer is, needs to be far more nuanced. And what I do in this book is I look at it and say, Napoleon, if he had died in Egypt in 1798 or somewhere in the fields of Italy in 96, 97, I think the war would have still happened because the reality was that France by, by 1799, 1800, France emerged as a hegemonic power. In fact, that's the failure of, of British uh, imperial policy, or foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis con continent, that it could not constrain the, the rise of France to hegemonic uh, position. And in that sense, the Peace of Amiens represents actually a great victory for France because it consolidated French gains. And by, uh, by argument, it also represents a, a, a frustrating um, a, a reality for the British who could not deal with France in peacetime. The, uh, um, um, and so, you know, we're looking at the archives, uh, uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Kenneth Johnson, who works on the uh, French uh, Navy, has discovered interesting documents in the French Naval Archives that shows how uh, dilapidated really the French Navy was at, at this time. Uh, and in 1803, for example, when uh, in the spring of 1803, we know that the French Navy would have only had 22 ships ready at the service. And, and uh, that's two ships of the line. 22 ships is a pittance compared to several hundred warships that Britain had at its uh, disposal. So it was so certainly not enough to confront Britain on the sea. And Napoleon knew that. That is why in 1803, he's very keen to push and prod, but not to the breaking point. And I think it's a bluster that really uh, gets the best uh, of him. Uh, and ultimately, it, Britain makes the right choice in that sense to uh, preemptively declare war and anticipate um, the rise of the powerful French naval force down the road. And do you think, do you think um, Britain, therefore, was in serious danger of invasion between 1803 and 1805 if there was such a small French naval force? Or was it just a question of what Napoleon said about having the channel for 24 hours and grabbing the <laughs> opportunity? I think there is no denying that Napoleon uh, went, to, at, you know, uh, certainly made significant preparations for the invasion in 1804 when, you know, uh, he prepared a, 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 a sizable fleet now uh, not the military not in the you know, ocean going fleet but we talk about the more transportation fleet to cross it but the threat i think never was never as acute as the british imagined in that sense because we know that by the time the grand operation of transatlantic uh, naval movement uh, launches napoleon already has shifted his attention uh, this is a late 18 of uh, late summer of 1805 he already has switched his attention to continent to the uh, the emergence of the third coalition. So I don't think uh, the invasion uh, would have materialized because there was a, the facts on the ground of uh, Austrian and Russian mobilization, armies already being in place. France could not afford to invade 
uh, Britain um, in, in 1805. Even if um, uh, Nelson had lost Trafalgar and it had been the British fleet that had been sunk and captured rather than the Frankish Spanish fleet? You didn't change your citizenship to French, have you? <laughs> <laughs> Losing Trafalgar. <laughs> you, you, you like yeah, what no, if, yeah, just like I do. Counterfactuals can be helpful. <laughs> What's the answer, Alex? <laughs> I, I, it's only not in 1805. I think his hands was, were tied by the fact that we had such a massive force in, uh, assembling on, on the eastern borders of, of France. Yeah. But does uh, tell me, do um, but writing books like this um, change your life? In that, are they do they dominate everything? Is it are you like me, where you can't really stop thinking about anything else when you've got a book uh, underway? What's the story? Um, well, I'm in fact in, in, in great awe of, of your uh, productivity, uh, <laughs> Andrew. Uh, uh, you know, looking at the last few books that you published, they are uh, stunning in size and scope and in, in level of detail. So you have to be obsessive about it. And um, I, I try to try to control it, but I'm not successfully. And I think we, we had a conversation about dreams, right? Um, and I have uh, this recurring dream, even after I'm done with the book, I have this dream of uh, being with Napoleon on the banks of the Berezina River in, in uh, November of 1812. And like the Groundhog Day, we try to, across the river and it never works <laughs> so it's like a nightmare <laughs> my god and, and yes exactly and you come from somewhere that was in the former soviet union we'll come we'll come back to that in a second um tell me um uh, a little about the um the process of, of writing you've talked about your research um did it take you to interesting places interesting uh, archives and things like that you know I mean I know this is a, in a sense a culmination of a life's work so you know where have you where have you researched through uh, uh, for, for this extraordinary book thank you um, I, I, I traveled um, in both in, in, uh, in all across Europe really from Swedish archives to uh, uh, Polish to um, Austrian uh, Greek's archive and um, of course needless to say uh, the, the British Foreign Office, French Diplomatic Archive, I've actually uh, maybe emphasized uh, trips to Paris a bit too much because I've, I've gone at least six times while writing. Um, oh, uh, ah, six two, times. Two, yeah, to, to Paris alone. Uh, and of course, Russian archives. Some, some places were harder to, uh, to get in. For, for, uh, uh, so my attempts to get into the, for, friend, uh, to, into the Russian Foreign Ministry um, archives were not approved so much it, of the was that because is that a political thing because you're american and um, and putin has closed down a lot of the historical archives of the second world war i didn't know he'd done it at the napoleonic wars I mean, <laughs> that really is that really is taking russian nationalism to a classic well degree. in my case uh, i'm i'm actually georgian i'm proud georgian mm -hmm. uh, so and of course you you probably remember that there was a war between russia and georgia in 2008 just as i was starting uh, research on this book so we don't have really good relations uh <laughs> any relations yeah. really um so i think that that certainly had it uh, had a, a, a role in it but on the other hand uh, i hanged out in, in the much better places like vienna paris and london so um, i can't complain um, it's uh, Napoleon's bicentenary, of course, of his death this year, um, and uh, we've just had it back in uh, May. Um, tell me about your overall view of um, of Napoleon, because uh, um, you know it is it, he is central, even though this is a global story, and of course there's endless goings on in South America and and China and Iran and places he never set foot, India and so on. Um, but, um, but yet he is, of course, the central figure, not least because the wars are named after him. Uh, <laughs> how do you, and I see behind you, you've got all his hats there, um, the St. Helena hats and various other things up in that uh, picture beside you. How did he, um, how do you, uh, you feel about him by the end? Um, that is, it's a very complex question um, in, in a sense, uh, uh, be, uh, because it goes um, to the very, you know, transformative experience I had. So I was born in Soviet Union. I grew up in the 90s amidst the collapse of the Soviet system. And especially in, in Georgia, this meant 
economic implosion of the state, civil wars, and the conflict with Russia, uh, uh, social and economic misery all around. And uh, I think to me, Napoleon was the thing that uh, made that, that life uh, tolerable. I would escape uh, the reality by reading about his exploits. And he changed my life in, uh, it, it, because it is, I never intended to be a historian. I wanted to be a lawyer, actually. And I finished the law school and practiced law. But it is the chance encounter and then uh, with one of Napoleonic institutes led by Professor Howard that uh, changed my direction of my completely uh, of my life. And I came over to study Napoleon. And I think over the years, my views of Napoleon, just like you, you have evolved because we all as, 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 as young, uh, you know, either children or, you know, uh, as, as young, uh, you know, the, the teenagers we are. Uh, drawn like you know to this Napoleonic legend, to this romantic vision of a of a of a uh, Prometheus who wanted to bring so much goodness to uh, to, to the world. Uh, but then um, you start studying and and really seeing the harsh reality of it. And I think today I have a much more circumspect appreciation of the man. There is no denying uh, or that he was his that as you said his personality was crucial, crucial to the French fortunes, but crucial to the, to the history, the way it unfolded. He, he, he is really a charismatic in, in, in his complexity, in, in his uh, commitment to work, in his genius for administrative detail, in his analytical mind, prodigious memory, or the ability to consume information unlike anyone I really know, and then select relevant details. Um, he is. But on the other hand, we know that there are these um, less pleasant, you know, distinctly unpleasant, actually, sides to him to contemplate. You know, he's a uh, he's a opportunist. He is uh, ruthless. Uh, you know, I was reading his correspondence just the other day and uh, came across a letter he writes in 1811 when he uh, orders to have the families of the seamen who switched to the British side to have their families arrested and put in prison and on a diet of meager uh, bread and water until those men change their minds and come back. So there is that callousness to him. Uh, and, you know, his decision, his, uh, you know, his, his decision on the rest restoration of slavery is one that we're still grasp, grasping with today. So, but uh, to me, that's the, the beauty of history in, in, in its complexity. And I always tell students that history is never, is, is never this, you know, simplistic. It's never black and white in that sense. It's, it's, it has a lot of uh, grayness to it, the shades, the spectrum of gray. And Napoleon is, is on that spectrum. There's, there are things that he accomplished that are undeniable and certainly France owes much of its modern institutions and modern administrative system and its legal system to Napoleon, uh, but there are other aspects of his legacy in places like Haiti uh, that um, I think require a far more nuanced approach. Um, I don't want any kind of nuanced approach to this next question. I want you to tell me what, what was the turning point in the Napoleonic Wars? Give me a day, preferably, <laughs> but if it has to be a week or a month, I'll, I'll allow that. But, uh, uh, I'll give you two. Uh, the maximum <laughs> <of> campaign. <laughs> I think um, there are uh, two really dates that I think stack, uh, stick out in my mind in, in that sense. And these are not probably ones that the, your audience uh, or our audience or you, you'll, you'll choose. One is uh, July 1st, uh, 1798, when uh, Napoleon landed in Egypt. And to me, uh, as, I, as I note in, in, in the book, this is the first example of a liberal imperialism. Uh, it, it shows how quickly the French Revolution has transcended French borders. And it shows this um, new kind of imperialism that comes on, on, uh, under the promise of liberation. Uh, it certainly represents the first attempt, modern attempt, to incorporate uh, um, the, this uh, Islamic society within the fold of European culture, European uh, uh, belief system. And to me, that's a, a, a crucial moment. And uh, I think another uh, moment that I will, uh, I will uh, highlight would be in 1811, and that is the fall of uh, Java. And the reason for that would be as to echo to what I've said earlier, and that is the fall of Java in 1811 uh, as a result of British invasion marks the end of Napoleonic wars in, 
in the in, in effectively in Asia in Indian Ocean, and every fresh gain that France had made in Europe since the beginning of the war was followed by far greater um, loss in Asia. And to now in 1811, Britain is triumphant. And so to me, this is the moment when Napoleon no longer has any bases uh, east of Cape and French fleet is thoroughly swept from the seas. And Napoleon can only hope to be dominant in Europe while Britain can be triumphant uh, on, on the world stage. So, uh, I cannot see how, you know, it, it's one of the counterfactuals that you can ponder of how that relationship will, would have worked out. Um, but it is, uh, to me, a crucial moment. Did your book change much while you were writing it? Uh, yes. Uh, how, long initial... did it take you, how long did it take you to write, in, you uh, know, in all? It took me 10 years, uh, uh, slightly over 10 years. Uh, my initial plan was to produce a concise but comprehensive overview of Napoleonic Wars, and I clearly failed at the concise part. <laughs> <laughs> not, not at all. Listen, I think that's not true. I think 642 pages is pretty slim, frankly, when you're talking about the Napoleonic Wars. You know, they go on for a quarter of a century. Uh, well, but you, you. you've chosen you've chosen to do them in a quarter of a century in about a hundred countries. That's so, right. So I think you have been concise, frankly. But in those ten years, your views must have must have changed about various things. How you know? How did it change from the first draft to the to the one we've got? I now? think um, I think when I started, I I wanted to have a more kind of generalized approach, and the more I uh, looked at the facts on the ground, I realized that generalizations will be a disservice and that uh, to fully understand the, uh, 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 the impact of this, of this era, you need to um, offer reader gr uh, uh, more details. Uh, and that requires more research, more digestion, more th synthesis, uh, but that also requires time. And, and so I had to dig in, in into regional coverage and expanding it. So one of the challenges, and that's, I think, one of the appreciations I got out of this book is the importance of economic dimension. So I have a separate chapter devoted to the uh, war by other means, as they call it, through, through economic warfare. And uh, that needs to be fleshed out uh, more, I think, in, in further research. What I've been very privileged uh, uh, is that I worked with an amazing editor at Oxford, and that is Tim Bent. I hope, Tim, you are watching, because he supported uh, me all every step of the way. And when I offered him a much radical expansion of the book, he never balked at it. Uh, and even though he doesn't like hearing it, he very patiently waited for it to be finished. Uh, I promised him three years and it took me a decade, but he's, uh, he, he stood by me um, every step of the way. Now, there are lots of characters in this book, um, huge characters, uh, Mehmed Ali, um, Sultan Selim III, um, uh, Fahd Ali, the Shah of Persia, um, Simon Bolivar, you know, you name it, um, all over the world there are uh, tell me who's your, uh, who did you find the most interesting? I think you already mentioned a few of them. So Bolivar is a very interesting character that I'm quite drawn to, both the complexity of his own personality, his life, his biography, his aspirations. Um, uh, I, I also find very interesting um, a, a man by the name of Pavel um, Tsitsianov, actually uh, a Georgian uh, uh, Tsitsishvili. Uh, but in the Russian service who becomes an architect of the Russian imperial expansion uh, in, in Caucasus. And I, I find the, com this, the complexity of his identity where he, he comes from a small country and yet is in the service of much larger imperial construct and he wholeheartedly embraces it. I find it quite interesting. Um, I also am very drawn to the, the personality of Toussaint Louverture who whose bio, you know, biography just appeared, uh, what, last year, uh, by Sunir Nazir Hassar. And then it's a brilliant book. And I, I think he, you know, I, you know it, it's a tragic life, um, but very interesting uh, to see the, the, the trajectory of him. And actually one of my favorite, and I think it's um, kind of looking behind the story, not, you know, we oftentimes focus on the flashy figures, but I, I actually, you know, have a great appreciation for the technocrats, <laughs> really. The people who are, you know, making the uh, empires run. It's people like Pierre Daru, um, the intendant of the Grand Armée on the French side, or 
a man that you are very familiar with, uh, Henry Dundas, right? Instrumental both on the Scottish Enlightenment, but also as the uh, what the home, uh, he, he presided over the Board of Control of Indian Affairs, Secretary of War, First Lord of Admiralty. Uh, he's such a fascinating figure, complex, uh, not particularly likable, but uh, nonetheless, um, I, I, I am drawn to him too. What, what was the hardest part of writing this book? I think the hardest one was uh, the, you know, the, 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 the amount of literature um, that you have to grapple with. It, it, you know, books keep coming and every time you see a new one, you realize how much you don't know. And you are following, you know, you're going into that rabbit's hole and it, go, it gets deeper and deeper. Um, but I think that was the hardest one. Because once, uh, uh, you know, once I had the structure of it more or less outlined, and I think structurally, this was a simple book because I organized it chronologically, but also regionally. Uh, and uh, once the structure is done, um, I think the writing part was not as, as complex. Now, I'm not as prolific as you in terms of daily output, uh, but I try to stay, uh, stay up late. Um, I still uh, reduce about 1,500 words a day and stay, stay at it. And well, that's your mistake. You shouldn't stay up late. You should get up early in the morning. That's that's your that's the, that's your only mistake, Alexander. <laughs> well, what are you we'll writing? Of coffee. <laughs> we all have we all have different ways of doing it. What's your uh, what's your next book? Um, I just I'm actually finished it. I literally sent it off today, this morning. Um, so congratulations! Thank How you. Exciting. What a great moment. Um, it is uh, a. a, a First modern biography of uh, Field Marshal Kutuzov, the great protagonist of War and Peace. Yeah. Uh, it came out not as long as War and Peace, but it's getting <laughs> it's close. <laughs> Is it as long as the Napoleonic Wars? Is it six hundred pages? Uh, I think it will be. Yes, I think. Fantastic. It will be, uh, when was the last? When was the last Kutuzov uh, biography? Uh, the last one came out in nineteen seventy six, and uh, as much as I hate saying it, it is god awful. <laughs> 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 not because well, I wrote a better one, but <laughs> no, yes, I mean that. That is pretty extraordinary, considering what, how, what a central figure he is to the defeat of Napoleon. For half a century to go by uh, without, uh, or jolly nearly half a century by the time it's published, is, yeah. um, is, is truly extraordinary. It is, it is incredible how occasionally you get these lacuna. The, 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 there's been one George III biography in half a century as well. You know, a, a, essentially, sometimes you can just spot these sort of massive you know, gaps. That's Very right. interesting. Right now, it's time for the uh, questions from the audience. And if I do this correctly, I am going to start um, uh, asking you some questions. Here we go. Yes, there are lots. Um, of course, there are. Because that was a fascinating talk. Uh, question number one: What sets Napoleon apart from other great conquerors and rulers across history, such as Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, and Julius Caesar? Uh, what sets him apart? That's a good one. Um, I think, um, um, I'm, well, um, one will be his reform, uh, his reforms that are far more uh, in, in depth um, than, let's say, Alexander's, so certainly Genghis Khan's. <laughs> uh, um, Napoleon is, to me, um, the last of the Enlightenment despots. He is a man who is is willing to see rational governance, efficiency, centralization um, in, in place. Um, and wherever he went, he imposed this vision um, for, for, for bad or worse of it, uh, for good or bad of it, uh, he, he, he did. And I think in terms of uh, his reforms, he's, he, he's quite, quite distinct. Uh, but more... Uh, um, more than that, I think it's his ability to win the battle for posterity, his ability to craft his own narrative that makes him such an interesting character. Uh, the only other one of the one that you talked about, I think it's Alexander the Great, who benefit, you know, kind of emerges uh, as, as this romantic hero, but not of his own making, right? Uh, he, he died too young, but Napoleon is very carefully crafts his own story. Uh, um, so I think um, that you know, he, he's very fascinating. Next question: Did the Napoleonic Wars in any way influence the War of eighteen twelve between the United States and Britain? What kind of relationship did France and the United States have at that time? 
So that's one of the arguments I'm making in this book is that War of 1812, the Forgotten War as, as uh, sometimes it is described, is that it is part and parcel of Napoleonic, wider Napoleonic conflict. Its origins lay in, in the imperial rivalries, its origins lay in the economic warfare that uh, uh, France and Britain were engaged in. Um, it has direct connection to events in Europe. Uh, if nothing else, uh, you think about the, uh, the army that Wellington has in Peninsula, which relies on supplies from the United States to keep the troops. And when the war began in 1812, Britain, actually Wellington had to scramble to find alternative sources for, of, of, of supplies. Um, and of course, we know that in 1814, 15, when the war ended in Europe, Britain was able to regroup in North America. So it has direct relevance. Now, the relationship between France and, and United States are quite, com uh, quite complex because on one hand, United, uh, France supported the United States in the American Revolutionary War and expected a much more, uh, more friendlier uh, policy from the United States. However, the uh, uh, United States chose to be um, uh, neutral in, in, in for most of the Napoleonic Wars, of course, until 1812. Um, and, and, and French were quite exasperated by that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm interested you called it the Forgotten War, the War of 1812, because um, I'd, I'd never bump into any Americans who've forgotten it. Uh, all too many of them, as far as I'm concerned, remember it, especially the bits where we burned down Washington and so on. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I wouldn't mind if it was forgotten, actually, sometimes. <laughs> How did, Napole how did the Napoleonic War have an effect on America economically, especially in regards to Louisiana? Well, um, economically, remember that until um, um, 1809, the United States is trading with all the warring parasites. Uh, so it does make money uh, uh, while uh, the war is raging in Europe. It is only um, you know, 18, starting in late 1807, especially 1809, that with the Embargo Act and, and um, other mechanisms that the United States has to respond to the increased pressure from European uh, powers uh, that are forcing the United States to choose a side. And ultimately, as we've seen, it will result to the, uh, to the break. Now, the Louisiana Purchase to me is a very crucial moment because it is tied to uh, the French realization, Napoleon's realization that uh, with the failure of his attempt to reclaim Haiti, now, Saint-Domingue, as it was known back then, that the future of the French empire in the Western hemisphere is, is questionable. And his decision to give up on Louisiana is, is fundamental to um, the new United States that emerges, right? If nothing else, it doubled the size of this country and gave it the new sense of, of mission for, for better or worse of it, right? Uh, um, and in fact, that's one of the subjects I'll, I, I am I intend on pursuing in my next uh, book, um, and that is the reassessing Louisiana purchase within both international dimensions, looking at not just the United States, but its impact on, uh, Sp on Spanish colonies, its impact on France proper, uh, because there is that you know, kind of uh, uh, perception that Napoleon sold it for money, but the money, he really uh, didn't get the money <laughs> because the money was paid over a long period of time. And by the time empire was actually coming already down. Since Napoleon was one of the figures in the Haitian Revolution, do you write about and include Haiti in your book? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I, it's impossible to understand um, the complexity of impact of revolutionary era or Napoleonic era on the Caribbean without Haiti, because this here we see a struggle for the sense of what is freedom, what is equality, how far it stretches. Uh, in 1789, the revolution proclaims the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen, and it starts with this wonderful promise of, quote, all men are born and remain free and equal in their rights, and it quickly becomes clear that this is too ambitious, too lofty, too aspirational, because uh, by 1791, the declaration will not be applicable to the uh, people of color uh, in places like Saint-Domingue. So to me, this is a story of revolutionary ideals, it's a story of the entire period. Uh, so yes, it is crucial, and especially because of Napoleon's um, vision for French colonial empire hinged on the reconquest of Haiti. So here you have this kind of two crucial pillars. One is the sense of freedom, equality that men like Toussaint Louverture 
and his supporters are, are fighting for, right? The slaves who will ultimately prevail and create the first uh, um, uh, republic established by slaves. Uh, but then there is this imperial narrative um, of, 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 of what Napoleon wanted to accomplish. And it's particularly vicious as well, isn't it? I mean, Napoleon can be pretty directly uh, connected to some of the, of the real outrages um, that took place in, in putting down that revolution. Absolutely. Revolution. In fact, I think that wa that's one of the reasons why Haiti, I think, is not as featured prominently in Napoleonic narratives, because it is a, a very awkward, inconvenient, very jarring in, uh, uh, moment where the French are resorting to um, um, to atrocities. Uh, you know, we, we know that they resorted to uh, early versions of gas chambers with sulfur gas uh, to, to um, kill the slaves. And um, it, 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 I think, clashes with the overall kind of prevailing narrative of, of Napoleon and as a reformer, because for all the reforms that he has done in France and that he exported in parts of Europe, you also have restoration of slavery, suppression of Haiti, uh, and, and the legacy uh, that is uh, far more sinister. And the killings in, job, in Jaffa. Yeah. Well. Yes, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, can you trace a direct link between the Napoleonic Wars and the Russian Revolution a century later? Um, I think uh, I, would, I would not go that far in terms of connecting it. I think uh, what I am arguing, in, in, especially in, in this new book that I wrote on Kutuzov, is that Russian triumph over Napoleon in 1812 gave the, the, the empire a new sense of mission. It certainly gave it to the Tsar. Alexander is, is uh, in 1813, 14, is driven by this sense of messianic purpose. Uh, we, we, we know he... he uh, del, you know, dabbles with his religious mysticism. And I think that is a moment where uh, there is a missed opportunity, I think, in the sense that uh, uh, Tsar came to power in 1801 as, as a liberal man who toyed with remarkable projects of constitutional transformations. Uh, and yet the struggle against Napoleon effectively prevents him from acting on these constitutional initiatives. And then he becomes, again, this victory over Napoleon transforms him into the very person that as a young man, he loathed and despised, which meant that uh, the opportunity for Russia to veer towards more constitutional development, I think is missed. And we know that the, when you know, Alexander dies in 1825, there is that attempted an abortive uh, uh, revolution, the Decemberist revolt which is, is the first liberal uprising and the last, uh, because next time we'll talk about revolution will be in 1917. Is the Napoleonic War uh, considered a world war since it was the French versus other European powers? How has the Napoleonic War affected the relationship between those neighboring countries of France? Um, it, is, um, it, is a, it is a war, it's a war of, uh, global ramifications um, in its, I mean, it's territorial reach, let's say. It's, it, if we look at the territory that it directly affected, it rivals, if not out, in my argument, it, it, out, it, it actually eclipses World War I, since uh, uh, we talk about all of Western Hemisphere being affected by Napoleon Wars directly. Um, but when we uh, look at the, uh, you know, uh, the, the realities on the ground, what you see is that the fear that France creates, in many respects, this uh, fear that oftentimes is overblown, forces other European powers to preemptively strike out into territories that otherwise they would have not gone right at the time. So case in point, Napoleon's invasion in Egypt creates the French fear in, in British circles. And Henry Dundas, for example, that I've talked mentioned a few minutes ago, is a great proponent of preemptively striking out to protect the British interest in India. So what do they do? They reach out in places like Yemen, Oman, Iran to shore up British influence there, either peacefully, diplomatically, or by force need to be. Uh, it's no coincidence that uh, Napoleon goes to Egypt in 1798, and you have anglo mysorean war starting with, with uh, Wellesley, right? Richard Wellesley storming, starting about them and bringing down Tipu Sultan, right? Who was perceived as, the, uh, as, as a possible Trojan horse for the French influence on the Indian. Um, uh, subcontinent, and, 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 and you know, a great 
element in the story is, of course, the, the fate of Spanish empire, uh, which, again, sometimes is, is subsumed by the Anglo-French rivalry. But we have to remember that Spain, in terms of its uh, uh, imperial domains, far uh, um, outshine Britain or France um, at, at the time, right? They controlled the territory that's stretched from uh, New Mexico down um, to Chile. Um, and the war saw this empire crumble. By 1815, the process is already underway and it will culminate in the emergence of independent Spanish states in 1825. We've only got five minutes left now, so I'm hoping we might be able to get two more questions in. One of them is, were there any challenges to writing this book from a global perspective? Were you wary of perpetuating a Western bias? Yes, I think it's, um, uh, yes, the answer will be yes, in, in the sense that we, um, you know, all of us historians, all of us have an inherent bias. Right? Um, some of it more overt, some of it less. Um, I, for example, was you know, careful to make sure that uh, Napoleonic legend is dealt with uh, appropriately, that I'm not falling to this Napoleonic sirens uh, calling me from the shore. Um, but of course, the, um, the challenge of writing global history is, is, is offering um, uh, one of my professors you know, used to say that history is like a kaleidoscope when you look through it and you have this constantly changing shape of it. And I think that's the challenge. Um, uh, but you can overcome this bias by looking at mu multiplicity of voices, uh, looking and bringing these uh, voices that um, traditional historiography ignores or for a variety of reasons. And I try to do that by consulting uh, sources in, diverse, in, in, in multiple uh, in languages and looking from the bottom up uh, to show that uh, the traditional narratives oftentimes um, are too simplistic and that we need to appreciate the nuance that history is never about simplicity and always about complexity. The last question. Um, as there are many educators and students in the audience, what do you think are the most important things to discuss when teaching high school students about Napoleon? Do you think there are compelling contemporary analogues? You've got three minutes. Um, <laughs> I th yes, I think Napoleon offers uh, many interesting um, kind of gateways or entryways into discussions. So here you have um, a, a person who by 1812-13 is castigated as, as an authoritarian who is, uh, whose uh, population is groaning under the burden of taxes and, and, uh, uh, and military conscription. We, have, we know that the desertion was rampant. Uh, and yet, just a few years later, he emerges as this romantic hero, right? As, as this completely re reinvented. That is one of the interesting elements in this story, the, how, the evolving nature of the human memory. It is also an interesting to contemplate about this juxtaposition of a reformer next to an authoritarian, the, a man who uh, can write rather lofty and aspirational letters to his uh, brothers, talking about the need of efficient government, equality, and yet next, uh, next to it also preside over what we can call a, a, a prototype of a police state, uh, at least in, in its early forms. So I think there are a lot of ways we can approach Napoleon to make him relevant to modern day uh, reality. Professor Alexander Mikaparedze, thank here, uh, here you are. Thank you very much for joining us in conversation today on the Napoleonic Wars. Don't spend all that $50,000 uh, all at the same time. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Louise Mira at the New York Historical Society. Uh, Jim Basker, of course, of the Gilda Lehrman uh, Institute of American History for uh, hosting tonight's event. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, coming along for what I think was a, uh, a truly fascinating evening. Thank Good you night. so much. Good night.